Hi everybody, welcome to Dulce America. My name is Bing Futch. Thank you for joining me. I got some more music theory for you today. We have been hitting it hard, and I mean hard, this entire year, just getting into it. And I want to thank everybody for all of the wonderful emails and messages that you've been sending saying, give us more theory. I never thought I'd live to see the day that people were excited about learning this stuff. And I'm very, very grateful and thankful that you have come over here to check out more about how to build beautiful music with the Mountain Dulcimer. Today we're getting into some exciting stuff. We are going to be moving chords around, learning about chord leading and what chords lead the best to other chords so that not only you can get used to the most popular chord uh, progressions out there, but also so that you can create your own songs, which is not as difficult as you might think. So we'll get into that today in large fashion. But before I get started, I want to say thank you to one of my patrons on Patreon, Barry Shawley. Barry, thank you very much for becoming a patron. In fact, you and Midge both signed up at the, about the same time, and I want to thank you for that. It means a lot to me, and it means a lot to everybody. It's kind of a gift that keeps on giving, because everybody else gets to benefit from what the patrons do every single day, and that's just to be a nice support for everything that I do here in the studio. That includes creating new tablature and video productions like Dulce America, or some of the other things that I shoot over on Patreon. It also helps with the creation of new music, new albums, and the creation of new technologies. Well, not necessarily the creation of new technologies, but the implementation of new technologies to help make productions here better. And in the past few years, I've been able to invest in some things that have really made things pop. And I want to thank all of my patrons for doing that and being there every single day as a part of my art. So thank you, Midge, and thank you, Barry. And if you guys are wondering what Patreon is exactly, think of it like a Netflix or a Hulu. But instead of it being all kinds of movie studios with all of their different programs, you've got one artist and they've got all of their wares available for you to download and enjoy. And that's basically what my Patreon's all about. For just $5 a month, you can get every single CD, book, piece of tablature I've ever written, uh, resource materials, and videos. Just $5 a month gets you access to download all of that stuff for free. And... After that, every single new thing, every single new thing, every Pringle new thing that I do, you will be able to download that hot off the press, like the recent book, Mountain Dulcimer and the Band, Book 7. All of those pages and all of those backing tracks went out to my patrons right after I had finished them here in the studio. So you get exclusive backstage access and some things aren't even going to be out for a couple of years. Like I'm working on the Disney Dulcimer Dreams books. That's still going to be a way down the pike. But my patrons already have six or seven different fully tabbed Disney tunes and demonstration tracks. And you can get in on that long before the general public does just by becoming a patron. If you're interested, you can go right on down here to this uh, website, patreon.com slash bingfutch. Go to the uh, featured tag section, click on open house and go crazy downloading all of the samples that you'll find there. If you like what you see in here, please do consider becoming a patron like Barry and Midge, and I thank you guys again very, very much. Okay, we're getting into the chord progression. So we know how to build chords now based on the past couple of episodes that we worked on here, and we got a root, a third, and a fifth to make a chord. More specifically, for major chords, that'll be a root, a major third, and a perfect fifth. For minor chords, that'll be a root, a minor third, and a perfect fifth. There are other types of chords as well, and we'll get into that here in a little bit. Now, besides those chords, we also know that we've got seven notes in a scale in any particular key. For our key, we're going to be in D major with D-A-D -D tuning. So the seven notes of the D major scale are D, E, F sharp, G, A, B, and C sharp. If you draw a Roman numeral under each one of those notes and make one, four, and five capital, or uppercase, make two, three, and six lowercase, and then make seven lowercase with a degree symbol next to it. That'll give you a first glance look at the scale degrees. And if you look at that, you'll know that we can use every single one of the notes in the D major scale as the root of its own chord. So we can build off of the first, third, eighth, seventh, seventh scale degree and get chords based on that. And there's a trick to doing that. And again, this is all from past episodes from this past year. But you can start with, say, the root chord, the D. That's going to give you a major chord. 
The four and the five chord will give you major chords. So out of the key of D, we've got three naturally occurring major chords. That's D, G, and A. If you build off the second, third, and sixth notes of the scale, you'll get minor chords that are naturally occurring. In the case of the uh, D major, where uh, E minor, F sharp minor, and B minor are those three chords. If you build off the seventh scale degree, you will get a diminished chord. In this case, we have C sharp diminished, and that is a root, a minor third, and a diminished fifth. The fifth comes down a half step. We can put other chords in there. We can put other notes in the scale for melody. But right now, we're just dealing with naturally occurring stuff. And uh, there's a science that all of these notes will move and communicate with each other because all of these notes are separated by what are called intervals. And those intervals are how we measure the distance between notes. So when we're moving chords, we're not necessarily just moving a big block of chord from here to there. We're moving three individual notes, and those individual notes all have relationships that carry over into the next chord. So if we move a D chord to F sharp minor, we're not just moving D to F sharp minor, we're actually moving each of the notes inside of D major to each of the notes inside of F sharp minor, and they all have relationships. And because of these relationships, these chords and these notes want to strongly move and resolve to some chords, and other chords, they're kind of like, meh, it's okay. And you'll be able to hear that very strongly as we move around some of this stuff. So let me give you a very, very simple version or uh, example of a chord progression. Let's say, uh, you know, like the old fashioned boiled him cabbage. We've got D, which then moves to G, fourth note of the scale. It's the four chord, G major. Then it goes back to D. Then it goes to the five chord, A major. And then it goes back to the root chord, back to the four chord for G back to the root, to the five, and back to the root. So we've got boil them cabbage down, boys, turn them whole cakes round. The only song that I can sing is boil them cabbage down. So a lot of people would call that a one, four, five chord progression because the three chords that we're using in this, in this song are D, G, and A. But if you were to follow it literally in order to get that particular movement of chords, we would call that a one, four, one, five chord progression because we go to one, we go to four, but instead of going immediately to the five chord, we go back to the one chord and then we go to the five chord. That is basically what a chord progression is, is moving these chords from place to place. The chord leading and chord voicing part of it is whether or not we choose to invert those chords so that the individual notes inside of each chord don't travel nearly as far to get where they're going. And that creates a more pleasing chord progression, easier to play and easier to sing. Let's look at another chord progression that's very popular. That's going to be the one, uh, one, six, four, five chord. The one, six, four, five. Now you'll notice that we've got a one chord, major chord. Then we've got the six, which is a minor chord. And then we go to the major four. And then we go to the five chord. This is one of the most popular chord progressions of all time, and it was used very, very much in the late 40s and the early 50s. So let me show you something about how chord voicing can help you uh, make better sounding music. Using that chord progression, we, not, we have D for our one chord. We can play it here. And then B minor is going to be our six chord. Our four chord is going to be G. 
that's the four chord, and our five chord, A. Now, if I were to play it like that a couple of times, you might eventually get a sense of what kind of popular music used this particular progression. But I'm not using the best inversions I can to make that happen. I'm not using the best voicings of those chords that I can to make that comparison leap out in your head. So instead of playing the D chord up here, I'm gonna play it open. Instead of playing the VI chord, the B minor, up here, I'm gonna play it down here. Again, I don't want the notes inside of those chords to have to travel too far. I want them to travel short distances so that those relationships inside of each of the chords makes more sense and creates a better fabric for harmony. So from open to a 210 B minor. Instead of going to G major up here, or even here, I want to be in that same neighborhood as much as possible so that these intervals work their magic. So I'm coming from 210 B minor to 310 G major. And then even though I think we could get away with a 101 chord for A, the five chord here, I'm going to opt for this particular A major chord. So if I put those in order, it might sound even a little bit more like the music genre I'm thinking about. If I add one more little element, the element of rhythm, it'll be unmistakable what kind of genre I'm talking about. Now it sounds like a doo-wop quartet standing on the street corner and making beautiful music. That's one of the great, great chord progressions, and it's been used by millions, millions of songwriters out there. It's popular because it feels good. It's popular because it sounds good. It's popular because it reacts. It, make, it creates a reaction in people when they listen to it. There's an emotional response to the way those move, and chords that lead to other chords powerfully in this way are the reasons why these chord progressions have been around for such a very, very long time. And people don't really think twice about using them over and over again because it's a shorthand way of immediately getting the kind of response you're looking for in music. Think about it in terms of a conversation that you have in passing with somebody. Say you're in a train station or at a Walmart or something and somebody next to you says, hey, how you doing? You say, I'm fine, how are you? You don't come up with a new, novel, fantastic, fabulously new way of saying hello to somebody that talks to you at a store. You use something that's familiar to everybody so that you know that you're responding to them positively as they've responded positively to you. And music is the same way. If we want to be archly creative, we can come up with really different new ways to move chords all over the place. And that might challenge some people. But if you really want to quickly say, Hello, I'm here to give you a song that's going to make you smile. The easiest way to do that is to use a shorthand form of chord progression that's been used for ages. And that's a good example of it right there. Another good example of that would be the one, four, five, four progression. Now, if I simply play it like that, it may not, once again, register as something you've heard before. But if I give it just a little bit of rhythm, suddenly it becomes a song from Greece, Summer Lovin', and lots of other songs from the 50s. So once again, you can take these chord progressions that have been around for a very long time, use them in your song, and then layer over them with unique melodies, 
and rhythms to make it your own tune. So don't feel like you have to like go out of the box every single time and create something that's never been done before. Actually, the challenge is to take these chords that have been used so many times and find a way to incorporate it into whatever it is that you're trying to say or sing and, uh, and make changes with everything except for those chords. Now, of course, you can add other chords into the mix that are not a part of the key. And that, those are your chromatic notes or accidentals. You can always do that and make things interesting, but right now we're gonna focus on just the basics, just the standards. Okay, so we started moving these chords around. Chords, chord progressions can be any length that you want them to be. They can be three chord progressions and you can do that chord progression over and over again. Or you can get into longer chord progressions that take listeners on a journey. As long as you bring them back home, and we consider home to be the root uh, of, the, of the tune, the root chord. As long as you bring people home, they won't mind going on a little journey with you. But part of the process of moving from one chord to another is a little trickier than that. So let's talk a little bit about uh, chord leading and chords moving to this position and that position. So I got a little chart I'm going to put up here on the screen. And the first thing I want you to do is not freak out by some of the terms that you see, uh, like dominant, subdominant, median, all that stuff. Don't worry about that. You don't have to know anything about that. But what you are going to want to know is that each one of those numbers on the chart represents a scale degree. So on the far right, you see one, and one's going to be in, for us right now, D major. And then of course two and five are gonna be, or sorry, seven and five are going to be uh, your seventh note of the scale and your fifth note of the scale. Thereby, you're gonna have your diminished chord at the seven and your five chord is gonna be a major chord and so forth and so on. So take a look as you go from right to left, starting with the root and number one. Here's how this is gonna work out. Just because of the amount of notes we have in each one of the chords and the relationships that those notes have with each other, if you move from the one chord, any of the notes that are closest to you are going to have the strongest pull. And when I talk about pull, in music we've got a lot of tension and release. We've got tension that happens when you hear something that seems restless. It's created a tension that needs to be resolved. Uh, feel like, a, uh, compare it to the feeling like, you know, the other shoe's got to drop. If I take a chord like this, it's a pretty chord. It's a uh, G suspended two chord. It's a pretty chord, but it also sounds like it's not quite finished saying what it wants to say until I resolve it to a G major. So you've got this resolution, this tension and release thing that happens in chordal music. But what we're looking for is eventually that resolution. No matter how short or how long our chord progression is, we want to have resolution. And not just like at the end of the chord progression, but within the progression itself in order to keep things balanced melodically and harmonically. So if I leave from the one and I go to the seven chord, or the five chord, it's gonna be a very powerful draw. And then going back from left to right, from seven or five to one, you've got the most powerful resolution that you're going to find in any given key, any, any, any given set of seven notes. Listen to the five chord, A, and listen to how final this sounds when I go to the one chord. It's like, boom, that's all she wrote. That's resolution at its finest, the five chord to the one chord. And I can voice this any one of a number of different ways.
that's a very very solid way of coming down from there now let's go from seven the seventh scale degree to one so we'll play our uh, c sharp diminished chord and then i can let go of these two and just come down to d on the seventh fret melody string there's a lot of resolution going on there i can also drop the middle string from six to five and keep my melody going like this now take a close look at this c sharp diminished six and a half six and eight that's the seven chord we're moving to the one chord and i'm going to be playing a d there notice that my thumb is going to come down one fret and that the middle finger is going to come down one fret showing that we're not going very far between these two chords with the actual intervals of the notes inside of the chords it's those types of small moves that we're looking for to get really compelling and good sounding chord voices and and that's a good description of what that's all about now go back to our chart now and if you look at the chart remember that the closest you are to the root the more satisfying that chord movement is going to be and the further you are away from wherever you're starting the least amount of satisfaction you will get talking like Yoda why am I anyway so if you go from the one chord to the two chord or the one chord to the four chord it's not going to be as final it's not going to be as powerful as moving to the seven from the one or moving to the five from the one or vice versa but they are the next choice over and they are not a bad choice at all let's go from the one chord to the second chord we'll go d to e minor and back to one You know it's not it doesn't scream out oh my gosh that was truly amazing but it, it certainly can be used right how about one to four going uh, from D major to G major now it sounds great but you notice also that if I were to leave that G hanging there you kind of say what isn't there more to this it does leave you hanging even if it's a major chord it still feels a little restless going from D to G but if we work that chart backwards we can all roads lead to one all chords love to resolve with the one chord so from G to one is very much a powerful resolution in fact if I were to voice that G differently and play three one zero instead and instead of playing a 002 for my D major, I'd play a 200. This is a good example of how to make the small moves work for you. What I'm doing here is I'm inverting the D major. Here, we've got a nice solid D major, D on the bottom. F sharp is the highest note in the chord. And in the middle is A. So it's a little mixed up from having your root, your third, and your fifth, but it still sounds pretty balanced. Now I'm going to take the F sharp and move it to where it's the bass instead. And that's coming from a G major chord where G was the root of that chord. And now I'll be moving the root down just one fret, just one half step down. So it's a very small move that I'm making here. But listen to the difference between this resolution between G and D to this resolution between G and D. Isn't that satisfying? That's some good stuff there. It's so satisfying, they actually have a name for that. It's a cadence, and they call it the Amen cadence. Why do they call it the Amen cadence? I think you know so um, that's a good example of how revoicing a chord 
uh, can make some really magical things happen when you're moving chords in a chord progression. So we could keep messing with all of these, go from the one to the six chord, go from the one to the three chord, and uh, this chart does wrap around. So you can go from the one and go right instead of going left. And you'll see the closest note there or the closest scale degree is going to be a three. So that's going to be a very strong chord progression and movement from one to three, going from D major to F sharp minor. Same thing with going from one to six, B minor. But as we get to the middle, you can see where the weakest movement is going to come generally uh, when you go to the middle of this little chart here. So two and four. Two is one of the weakest movements you can get because you're just simply moving up the scale from D to E minor. One way to change that, if you do indeed want to go to your second scale degree uh, for a chord, is to invert the chords. So we can go from two. And that sounds a bit different, and that might give you some more pull and some more pep, some more tension or resolution, depending on what you're looking for as you're moving things around. So that's a good example of how these chords move back and forth and work with each other. And, uh, and I hope that you can get into that and experiment with that, especially in the jams. Because when you start to realize what chords go well together, you'll also realize how many people actually use this often, over and over again, and how many of the great songwriters used it as well, which means it'll help you anticipate when those chords are changing in the jam. Even if you're not familiar with the tune, you can just tell by the melody and you can tell by, uh, by the chords that have been played already that there'll be a form involved and you can almost second guess what that next chord is going to be and, uh, and not be too surprised when you turn out to be correct about it. So let's talk about some longer chord progressions and how you might use this chart and your ears to navigate. So I'll start with D. I'm going to go to a minor three. Now I can go back to the one chord and repeat that three. At this point, I ask myself, where do I want to go? Do I want to go higher in pitch? Do I want to go lower in pitch? Do I want to go to a major chord and maybe introduce some more of a happy feeling? Or do I want to continue on the minor thread and try and keep it where it is? Again, I'm going to keep that balance depending on the subject matter of whatever I'm trying to put across, whether it be melodic or whether it be lyrical. So you want to ask yourself that question if you're writing your own music, is where do you want to go next with it? And how do you want to reveal the narrative later on? If this is the verse, I might want to start off really, really super sad and stay minor as much as possible. Remember, I've got three choices for minor chords. I've got three choices for major chords. And I've got one choice for a diminished chord. So I'm starting with my D. Bring it up to minor three. I can keep it in the minor department and then go to the minor six, B minor. And then bounce back to the minor three. I can then go down to the minor two, which is E minor. Then go to the minor six again. I'm just ping-ponging back and forth between some of my choices here to make a longer chord progression. Now I could do a couple of things here. I could just get out of the minor for a second and get some resolution because we're not getting a lot of resolution by bouncing around inside of those minors. But I can go to the major five now. And that five really wants to lead home, so I can start the next verse, or get into the chorus, or whatever I'd like to. That 
that would be a nice round complete chord progression but I could do other things and change it around just a little bit going from the one to the minor three then to the minor six back to the minor three bit more motion in there going down to the minor two back to the minor six back to the minor two back to the minor six and then go to the five and then go to the one so just by putting one more chord in there it changes things around a bit more and on that chord uh, on that chord itself you can hang whatever melody or lyric or anything else you like to so be thinking about that as you're moving things around so if, with something with that much minor in it I think even if it's a sad song I'd find a way to get into the major side of things if I broke into a chorus so let's say that's a verse how do I can contrast that and get some happiness and hope in there depending on the song let's go go through it again here from D Notice I tagged that uh, a little bit differently the second time through, setting up for a change. So we know the one chord likes to go to five, but we were just at five. So I'm thinking I want to go major. So my other choice, since I'm already starting with D, is to go to the G chord, which is a perfect, perfect way to go because we're major. But we also know that the G chord is a bit restless so that when we hit that, we'll have some other places that we can springboard off to. So let me go ahead and uh, mess around with something here. I'll go... Uh... Four loves to go back to the one chord, so I'm taking it back to the one, another major chord. Now I could either go back to the one chord and then five or I could just go right to the five from the four chord second time around five chord and then come back to one so listen to the whole thing and uh, see how things go from dark and minor to light and then back again. And I'll throw a little melody in there too. Voila! Suddenly we've got music happening. So you can see how I've taken some things and kept them very simple and, and then I've just sort of changed a few little elements to create different twists and turns. It doesn't take anything really complicated. All it takes is what sounds good to you and what you know now about the Mountain Dulcimer fretboard that you didn't know before about moving chords around and moving those melodies around and getting these results. So I encourage you to try and move these chords around a bit. If you don't already have them memorized, go ahead and memorize those notes on the scale and use your three chord shapes, L shape, slant shape, extended slant shape, to negotiate those chords 
and also invert your chords, flip them over. Try putting your own very, very short chord progressions together. All you need is three chords. All I got is a red guitar. Three chords and the truth. All I got is a folk craft dulcimer. I got three chords and the truth. You don't need a whole bunch. You can get a fourth chord in there if you want. The fewer chords, the easier to play. The easier to play, usually the easier to sing and the easier to get people to join along with you. Have fun with this. We're going to get down even deeper into uh, this with the next episode because now we're going to change things up and we're going to start adding in accidentals, accidentals and other non-naturally occurring stuff inside of the scales. Thank you guys very much for joining me and I'll be back with more right after, I guess about a week. <laughs> Until next time, everybody, this is Bing Futch. Thank you and good day.